30 years ago, Estonia became the latest small European nation to declare independence. Faced with terrible winters, they struggled to even find petrol for ambulances and the supermarket shelves were empty. But today, Estonia is one of the most successful small countries in the EU. How did they do it? <laughs> That the Estonian people were preparing themselves for independence whole their lives. We actually planned a lot of this stuff ahead since we had a firm belief that we would become independent. A wave of young people took over, dismantling everything. So we said these people who have been working for the Soviet Union and have been supporting this kind of things have to leave now. We need to clean the entire state and by cleaning the state I mean everything. The first years were tough for this new Baltic nation. You literally had nothing on the shelves of grocery stores um, in, in Tallinn or elsewhere in Estonia. We were in a very different situation. But Estonia embraced the new digital world and in just 20 years its GDP has increased fivefold. It's nothing short of uh, extraordinary. Um, uh, it's been very interesting times to live through. Uh, to see this, uh, this transition in, uh, in the country uh, happening within, basically within a generation. It's very early on the 24th of February and it's absolutely freezing. This is the date the Estonians have adopted as their Independence Day. It's a national holiday, so everyone has the day off, including school pupils, and they'll be singing later, of course. But at the moment, tens of thousands of Estonians are making their way here to the centre of Tallinn to watch their national flag being raised at the crack of dawn. And they come every year, even after all this time. Why is it so important to come out in the middle of the night to get here? Because it's a special day for us. <laughs> yeah, We're all from the same dancing group, so we wanted yeah. to come together. Uh, this is like one the time uh, that everyone is in Estonia. <laughs> so we just like gathered here, <laughs> best, all the best friends of us. And then, yes, yeah. it's just a gathering thing, a little bit for and us. Do you do this every year? Oh, uh, we did. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Two years ago we did, with yeah. the same skirts. Yeah, two years ago we even danced here, so... Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not being cheeky, but you don't look like you were born when your country became independent. No. No. <laughs> right. So why is it so important for you still to come out and celebrate? Because you are independent, you don't need to keep celebrating it. We're raised very patriotic. Yeah. <laughs> It's just like a very nice feeling that you're here and Estonia got free and independent and just looking at the Estonian flags is just something that we're kind of born with, just respecting that. The stories of our grandparents and uh, parents uh, are the reason we come here and celebrate the, our freedom and independence. 
What were those stories that still motivate young Estonians? Estonia first proclaimed independence in 1918, after two centuries of Russian rule. But soon the country was occupied, first by the Soviets, then the Nazis, then the Soviets again, who ruled for almost 50 years, with any affection for an older identity cruelly repressed by the KGB. Her name is Magda. She was 31 years old when strangers walked into her apartment, told her to get dressed and took her away. Her seven-year-old daughter ran after her and shouted, Mom, take me with you. But they didn't allow it. Linda almost got arrested. But one nice man came and warned her. Others were shot. If he had got to some of us, I would not be here tonight, says Linda. Where she was told to dig foundation holes into clay and plumb thrust, load bricks and gravel, and build railroads. In one month, March 1949, 20,000 people were deported, most to Siberia. Two-thirds were women and children under the age of 16. I'm in Estonia's second city and ancient university town, Tartu, to meet Mariu Lauristen, from a political family, she studied here and at Moscow University. In 1986, she witnessed a seismic shift at the Kremlin. President Gorbachev introduced Glasnost to modernize and refresh the communist bloc. But in the Baltic states, the newfound political freedom gave the chance for dreams of nationhood to be rekindled. She found herself at the heart of an independence movement that would be known as the Singing Revolution. See on meie esimene võit, kuid see ei ole veel lõplik võit. The Estonian people were preparing themselves for independence all their lives. Through whole time in Soviet Union and, and uh, do, then especially, say, tensely during those three years we had the Singing Revolution. We were prepared. Throughout the years of repression, huge singing events continued. The choirs were a symbol of Estonia's unique culture. Now music became a centerpiece of its politics as well. We were excited, but you no, know, not it was not solely that, because it was really hard work because we had to make all preparation, because from one side we had the big rallies going on. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people coming out on different places and so on. There was this big uh, excitement among the people. But at the same time we had to prepare this uh, uh, change, institutional change, because what is really our lesson maybe, when we look, for example, Arabic Spring or all these kind of movements, then you, you cannot achieve democracy by movement. You have to prepare democracy, uh, b bring a building up institutional order. And that's what we did. We not only were singing and shouting on streets, but we were making hard legislative work. The Estonian Supreme Soviet was quickly won over with the claim that independence was a restoration of the 1918 former state, not a secession. Campaigners urged the population to sign up and reclaim their citizenship. But the Baltic states were still occupied by Russia. A year later, in August 1989, the movements of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania combined to form a 400-mile chain of two million people demonstrating their unity for freedom. Hey. Hey. 
we made the Baltic chain to make pressure on Gorbachev, to make international pressure on Gorbachev and to call international attention. So we were really organizing this chain as international media event. <laughs> But Moscow was not impressed, despite a referendum to confirm independence carried by almost 80%. In 1991, Gorbachev's liberalization of the Soviet Union stuttered. Hardliners in Moscow reacted against his changes and tanks rolled to end the Baltic independence movements. In Estonia, Russian troops besieged the city's TV tower in a stark reminder of the old days when military might enforced Moscow rule. But the Russian putsch found little support and Boris Yeltsin took over. The conflict diffused. Estonia had achieved a bloodless revolution. We had tanks on streets, Russian tanks on streets, but still we got this resolution, we sent it over the world that now we declare that the Estonian uh, constitutional independence is restored. Uh, it's the same republic which was occupied by the Soviet Union. We ask for recognition of our restored independence. And we get it, we get it very, very quickly. Iceland was the first. Iceland was the first. Independent at last, but alone. Estonia set up its own currency pegged to the Deutschmark, but the country had traded almost exclusively with Russia and now the economy collapsed. It was a government in crisis from the start. 1993, in the midst of a Baltic winter with daytime temperatures below minus 10. The state coffers are empty, businesses face bankruptcy, pensions might not be paid, there's a struggle to find petrol for ambulances, and the shops are empty. Mark Lahr became the first formally elected Prime Minister at the age of just 32. He now works for the Bank of Estonia and is recovering from a stroke. He went in the street without any cars, because there are no cars, because there are no, this is no gasoline, because all the gasoline deliveries having stopped. Estonia is a country which is not exporting anything. So we are exporting maybe 5% of our production. So we are selling everything to the Soviet Union and it's just disappearing, not giving us back the money. Of course, nobody in the world market wants such a bad production, but we are selling them. <laughs> We have unemployment, which is by the prognosis about 40 to 50 percent. Our ruble is in very bad inflation. It's going, inflation is 1,000 percent a year. So everything is rationed. The bread, milk, is uh, recent in the shops. The changes were really very, very harsh because as we, we didn't have money, then, for example, I as Minister of Social Affairs, I, I had to come to Parliament and say that we abolish all Soviet time pensions. And instead of pension, we started to pay just some old age allowance, very, very low. Because when you cut and you cut, nothing happens. There is no trade, there is no trade, and that's it. And, uh, and of course, there will be a lot of noise and a lot of angry people, but not too much because everybody decided that that's our decision to be independent. And when we are independent, then we are really independent, that's it. People are patient, expecting that country will grow up will improve and after this harsh time there will be better times and we really have to be very thankful even when we had 
uh, in these times uh, after liberation, big uh, meetings, uh, then very often it was said that well, now we have to be thankful not for any of politicians or persons, but we have to be thankful for all people who were so patient to go through harsh times in belief that their own country will stand up and then become to flourish someday. And it really happened. The transformation did happen. Help and investment came from Nordic neighbours. There were even food and clothing parcels from abroad. But very quickly, Estonia began to grow as Europe's newest democracy. It was a society shaped by a new generation, without baggage from the communist era, with new ideas and a blank canvas. A former banker, Tarmo Juristo, now leads an Estonian think tank. The previous generation was uh, was by and large wiped away from, uh, particularly from the uh, from the uh, economy. Uh, this didn't go the same way, by the way, in uh, in, in Latvia and, and Lithuania, but it did happen this way in, in Estonia, and this uh, did create a huge opportunity for uh, my generation in in early 90s. So you could. Uh, pretty much do whatever you, you wanted. I was working for, uh, for Hansa Bank, uh, which was uh, one of the original uh, success stories of Estonian economy. And, and, uh, and at that time, we had uh, Hansa Bank's uh, board, of the board of directors. Uh, the older guys were like in their mid-30s, and which to me looked uh, really old at that time. And uh, I remember the incredulous uh, faces of uh, European bankers who came to establish relations and then suddenly found themselves sitting behind the table with uh, basically teenagers. A new Tallinn stands in the shadow of the old town, founded by a new generation. Thomas Hendrik Ilves spent 10 years as president and is credited as the man who identified a golden opportunity that's Estonia's main claim to fame today, its digital economy. The Insight for me came in 1993, which was four years after the invention of the hypertext transfer protocol or HTTP, which is the basis of the web page or the web. But I looked at this and I said, wow, this is one place where we are on a level playing field with everyone else. When it comes to building big highways, you know, the Germans, their autobahns, the US interstates, they've been doing this for 60, 70 years. But here's some place where we are no worse off than anyone else if we get in at, on the, the initial stage. So the proposal actually initially was simply to put computers in every school, connect all the schools, and the kids will take off. And they did. Estonian education has fueled 20 years of digital innovation. 90% of schools deliver subjects using digital technology, by choice, not compulsion. And 70% of kindergartens have access to robotics. Scottish education was once the envy of the world. Now a different small country is turning educational heads. Estonia, like Scotland, always had control of its education system and taught in its own language, not Russian. But with independence, it was able to completely shrug off Soviet thinking and embrace the outlook of its most go-ahead Baltic neighbour, Finland. Kristel Rilo is head of digital education. When we gained our independence uh, from Soviet Union, we had uh, the luxury of uh, starting fresh as well as take the best parts with us. And uh, when moving more towards the digital uh, path, then uh, bearing in mind the resources in our disposal, it was just simply not possible being non-digital. So uh, this is where, the, uh, where this kind of mindset started with rather young uh, uh, government uh, who was open to make a change and open also uh, for taking the risks. Um, in general, Estonia is really right at the top now for basic education uh, in the PISA charts. What have you done that's made the big change? First, autonomy of uh, schools. 
We have agreed on the learning outcomes that need to be achieved, but uh, it's up to the schools and teachers to choose the way they and their students suit best. They have uh, different uh, exercises today and they also have free breaks so they can decide when they are doing this. And right now they have a jumping thing. But they also can climb or, uh, or do something more, but they can decide when they need this break. The second thing is our teachers do excellent work with helping uh, weaker students along like to be, to be better uh, and uh, they pay a lot of attention to have this kind of very strong uh, average level of students. To be clear your children go to kindergarten from the age of one till six, seven? Till uh, uh, six, seven, yes, uh, but it, it depends. This kind of normal uh, beginning of uh, uh, age is three, but uh, very many go already before before becoming two. So is that an important part of education that they get to play as children? Because our children are going to school at the age of five and even four. Yes, that's uh, definitely the case. Uh, of course, in Estonia, we don't have only the playtime in, uh, in kindergarten. We have also the national curriculum for kindergarten. So uh, the school would have already the basic level to proceed from. In Scotland you get the feeling that, that education is all exams, exams, exams. Um, has Estonia moved away from that? Yes, we are on the way of moving away from that. We, ha we have at the today's system uh, the final exam in the end of uh, lower secondary and the ninth grade in here. But uh, the discussion already pre-Covid were about losing or getting rid of the exams. Our minister had very clear understanding that, that we don't need this. And the COVID again, uh, with digital uh, assessment tools that we have in place already, that we are on the way of moving, just supporting, in, indeed supporting teachers and students in learning, not controlling what have been done. The education system has spawned a nation of digital entrepreneurs and innovators. Three Estonian engineers built Skype with almost 700 million worldwide users. The taxi and scooter company Bolt was started by a 19-year-old and now has a presence in 100 European cities. The adoption of digital technology is everywhere and has of course been absolutely incorporated into government and everyday life. Annette Numa is a digital expert and evangelist at the eEstonia Briefing Centre. Everyone must have a digital ID. This is a compulsory document for absolutely every person who lives here in Estonia. So whenever someone is even moving here and then staying here longer than two or three months, they need to have one as well. Because on a, on a card we have our identity code number, so which is given for us already when we are born at the hospital. And, and by this code, different ministries and of course also private sector institutions can identify ourselves. And, and I use this card for traveling. Uh, all my prescriptions, my medicals are on a Card. Uh, this is my driving license. I get my discounts from shops also by using this one single card. So I've been always saying to my uh, friends who live abroad that if you would check my wallet, there is only two things there. Um, there is my credit card and there is my electronic ID card. That's all I need to carry. And does that card, that system behind it, how does it work? Because a lot of people would feel scared that the state had that much information and power. So uh, it shouldn't be scared at all. So you only submit your information to one single uh, institution. And in, in that sense, when we talk about one part of the information, you only uh, store that in one place. And when the other institution want to know this information that is not stored on their servers, on their system, then they need to request this information from, uh, from the other platforms by using our data exchange platform Exode. And of course, in order to do so, you need to have agreement uh, between the different institutions 
institutions. But the very important thing to know about that here is that every citizen has such thing called data tracker. So I can track everything. So when, um, let's say the police is stopping me when I'm, um, when I'm on the way to the shop here and um, they want to check my driving license. So I'm going to give them my uh, electronic ID card and they're going to check if I have a valid driving license and maybe my background. And then I can go home later and I can see under the data tracker that police at this time of the day have been checking this part of my information. So we have given our people so much transparency. So I can truly say that I trust my sa uh, state a lot here because I feel that the power of my information is fully in my hands not the other way around. Um, you can pay your tax by this e-system. How much time and money does all of that save? So uh, we have been declaring our taxes already in the past 20 years now. So since 1999, that was the first year when we started declaring the taxes online. Uh, from the citizen's point of view, uh, it takes me only one minute in order to declare my taxes. And when we think about in general, like how much time and money this entire system helps us to save, then it's very tricky to say because we don't really have anything to compare to. Uh, but by the state point of view, then of course, it's a lot of money because we make the entire system work much more efficient. I've, I've heard it's something like 2% of GDP that's saved with this. That's just by, uh, by signing documents online, by using our digital signature, just by using one single solution. And this is 2% of the GDP. So it's, it's, it's a very, very high amount of money. And Estonian state only, um, only uh, pays or like um, I would say uses 1% of uh, our entire state budget in order to keep up the system. If you only use 1% of the state budget in order to keep up this entire system and you already get back 2% of your GDP by using one single solution out of thousands of them. So I, I think this is just like a great example for the rest of the world that these services are so much needed. Digitization is everywhere in Estonia. The country's brand new futuristic national museum stands outside Tartu on the runway of a former Soviet nuclear bomber air base. Of course, the ticket is digital. That's for you. Thank you. Uh, if you swipe uh, your ticket at the screens, then it turns to English. Because I've got an English speaking yes. ticket. <laughs> wow. Right. It brings the displays alive and behind the scenes the swipe data collected is analysed to find out how different audiences interact with different exhibits. If it sounds like surveillance, it's nothing like it used to be. So we're now entering to a border zone and uh, entrance only with uh, permits. Oh, you have been followed. <laughs> right, <laughs> I've been spotted. <laughs> Imagine having a superpower as a neighbour, one that ruled your country, sent thousands to Siberia, still invades other neighbours, and whose people form a third of your independent country today. Slava Ukraine! Heroem Slava! Slava Ukraine! Heroem Slava! Slava Nazi! Smert Voroham! Da, da, svoboda! Yet, yet, Soviet! Da, da, svoboda! Yet, yet, Soviet! It took three years after independence for the last Russian military to leave. Now Estonia has an army of its own and an international peacekeeping role. It has 3,000 full-time soldiers but 20,000 in reserve and the support of its NATO family since it joined in 2004. It's probably fair to say that joining NATO was uh, was more of an important milestone and, and more of a something which is uh, is widely perceived in Estonia as a cornerstone of Estonia's defence policy. However, joining the EU was much broader uh, political project, which also means uh, not just economic uh, consequences and, uh, and benefits, uh, but uh, also uh, wider political, cultural changes. 
being part of the uh, the common uh, labor market, which is something that uh, has uh, impacted uh, uh, not just the Estonian economy, but also tens of thousands of people in, in Estonia. There's been a lot of EU money flowing into the country, a lot of European companies Scandinavian companies coming here, investing here, creating jobs, bringing in money. It's been very interesting times to live through, uh, to see this, uh, this transition in, uh, in the country uh, happening within, basically within a generation. The capital, Tallinn, has seen the most dramatic development and social change. But two-thirds of the population live in the countryside. It may look traditional, but a vibrant rural parliament brings villagers together every two years, and there are three times more councils than Scotland. Here's where Estonia's cultural identity survived the bad old days and still binds communities together. I think uh, when we were in Soviet time, we, didn't, uh, we kept our culture. We tried to hide it somewhere or just to still sing Estonian songs and still uh, wear our national costumes and uh, we tried to maintain our heritage even when we are a big part of Soviet Union. So it was just our way to become free and sing, because we didn't fight, they didn't know what to do, because we were singing. I think the choirs in the rural places, when you don't have much activities, so coming like here, I am going every week, every Wednesday evening for singing. There's a nice group of people. We have uh, trips together, go to the festivals, have travel. So it's like uh, the way to spend your time with the community. The country celebrates its traditions and identity big time. But what kind of future lies before Estonia's young? The country's been criticised for a flat tax regime that leaves well off paying the same as the lowest earners, just 20%. And corporations can skip tax altogether if they reinvest. What does that mean for ordinary people? One man, well placed to make international comparisons, is the Estonian TV journalist Johannes Tralla. A former EU correspondent, he presents a travelogue series from his bike. There is a huge inequality problem in Estonia and when you look at the wage gap between the capital and the well-paid jobs and the countryside with people going on their lives with, with ordinary jobs, it's, uh, the gap is, is quite remarkable, it's quite dramatic. It could look though that Estonia is a kind of race to the bottom society, uh, which is a sort of haven for the super rich, it's got such low taxes. Is that the way it really works? When you look at Estonia, you have a lot of this type of one man and a dog uh, type companies, as we, as we call them here. Every taxi driver is an entrepreneur. Um, you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of folks in actually all uh, fields of life, from uh, from artists, uh, musicians, I don't know, freelance um, actors 
who are all registered, they all have a company. A lot of people have their company. So these benefits that we talk about, this uh, freedom of, uh, uh, of certain taxes that you get when you're an entrepreneur is not used so much, uh, so much by uh, foreign entities, super rich coming uh, from abroad. We don't really have these oligarchs in Estonia. Everyone can benefit from it. The question is, though, how do we get to a more even society, a society where you don't have this, these dramatic gaps? And that's a question that I'd say is still, uh, still unanswered in Estonia. I mean, everyone has benefited from the economic development, that's for sure. And I mean, a big part of the society can now live a life that could be only dreamed about in, in the 80s or in the early 90s, but we still have a lot to do. It's 30 years, obviously, since uh, you became independent again. Has the influence of Soviet policy, thinking, culture, language, has that all left you in Estonia now? When you look at uh, the, um, the unsolved question of, uh, of the Russian minorities here, we, we still have like um, we still have two parallel systems of, uh, of kindergartens, somewhat also of, of education um, in, in schools. A question that no one really wants to touch because it's, it's politically sensitive. The parties can't really agree on, on a solution. So there are certainly questions where you can still see the Soviet heritage, uh, the values of, of that era being, uh, being supported by a significant part of society here. And at the same time, you look at the um, urban youth, uh, and it's very hard to distinguish uh, Estonian uh, young entrepreneurs, startup guys, intellectuals, I mean, whatever, uh, people in the cultural sphere, from those who are uh, living in uh, Berlin or in uh, Copenhagen. You have divisions in society. Just how far and fast can Estonia go? Estonia is not going to catch up with Luxembourg uh, in terms of the per capita GDP. So we might get to, uh, you know, perhaps past uh, such countries like Italy or Spain in, uh, in 30 years. But the question is not going to be catching up. The question is going to be setting your house in order, making the best out of what you've got. There has been increasing talk about revising the, uh, uh, the tax uh, and taxation framework in Estonia because the, the structure, underlying structure of the economy has changed. Changed. The structure of the society has changed. What people expect from the society has also been getting closer to uh, what you just referred to before as a Scandinavian model, which we, uh, we see working uh, uh, just, you know, basically right across the border. I'd like to think that we can still build a friendly, inviting country for the generations to come. But at the same time, of course, uh, the European Union uh, will hopefully be in the future a place where people can work and travel freely and Estonia uh, is not going anywhere uh, from, the, uh, from the EU at least. Uh, I hope I, won't, I will never see that happen. And by the way, I hope uh, we will soon have Scotland uh, in the EU one way or another. So, as Johannes comes to terms with wearing a kilt on a motorbike during a film trip to Glasgow, I'm almost at the end of my trip to Estonia. It's a remarkable story for a country the size of Wales, with obvious parallels for Scotland as we approach our own crucial decisions. The idea of national identity, it, it is nothing negative. It is absolutely the fundamental idea, because without that, we, 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 we could be now part of Russia. <laughs> you see, and, and the, the, the previous big colonial empires, they really don't understand and don't, don't really even want to understand that. Most important was to get courage. Because take this decision about always the courage. And you couldn't wait too much. Because the courage is something that comes and goes. Uh, but when you want one moment, to just you need to have it. And then all other things follow. <laughs>